Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitch with Oculus. Welcome to another Oculus webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this webinar, The Future of Dry Eye. Our speaker this evening is Dr. David Kading. And Dr. David Kading owns a three doctor, two location practice in Seattle, Washington. He graduated from Pacific University College of Optometry before being accepted to their prestigious cornea and contact lens residency. Dr. Kading specializes in complicated contact lens fittings. His referral-based dry eye and contact lens clinics are well known for utilizing the latest technology for complex and rudimentary dry eye or contact lens fits. Dr. Kading welcomes interns from five different optometry schools into the practice and is a frequent guest lecturer at schools around the U.S. Outside of practice, he co-owns Optometric Insights which helps emerging optometrists transition into the practice of their dreams, as well as educating clinic, clinicians in novel and unique ways to diagnose and treat patients. Dr. Kading enjoys conducting clinical research within his practice. He has written over 100 articles and papers and has given several hundred lectures in North America, Europe, and Asia. He works closely with industry, publications, local, state, and national organizations. He has a regular column in Contact Lens Spectrum, Contact Lens Today, and a digital video series called Clinical Insights on iTube OD. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the question box at the right of your screen. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. David Kading. Hey, thanks, Craig. That was a great introduction. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this presentation because it's been uh, it's it's been about six months that we've been incorporating some of the uh, the newer dry eye technologies into our clinic, and what has been really fun about it is the way that um, it's changed the paradigm of our dry eye treatment. And you know, I'm not just saying that from the perspective of we got new equipment and it's kind of fun, but it's really changed the way that we're looking at patients and treating patients. And as a result of bringing in new equipment and some additional learning, we've actually launched a new practice um, within our practice called the Specialty Dry Eye and Contact Lens Center. And we're, we're focusing on uh, research, we're focusing on uh, advanced patient care, and are even going out to local referral, uh, local doctors in, in looking for referrals with, re with regards to dry eye. And historically, um, I think what we've found is an optometric profession as an ophthalmological profession is that we, we try to avoid dry eye, and we have over the years. Um, but I think as we get some uh, new abilities to understand what's causing dry eye, that it'll allow us to have some more advanced opportunities to treat it as well. Uh, so that's that's been really, really, really neat. So how common is dry eye? Uh, according to one study, uh, nearly 50% of Americans regularly experience some sort of dry eye symptom. And uh, when we when we ask different clinicians, you know, how often do you see dry eye patients? Um, holding a dry eye seminar here in my office, I, I think one of the doctor's response was was the perfect one. And he said, "Well, that kind of all depends. Is it uh, that I'm dry and uncomfortable all day long?" Or is it that occasionally, from time to time, my eyes get dry? And we know that our patients, when they're in challenging environments, may experience you know, dry eye at a different level, particularly with regards to when you know, the heat is on in their car or the air conditioner is really flowing. So kind of an interesting concept, but we, know, we also know that 19% uh, use over-the-counter eye drops on a pretty regular basis. And also, 70% uh, of adults that do have dry eye symptoms said they haven't really visited an eye care professional for dry eye treatment. And that is really a, a, a great aspect of practice, potential practice growth for us is to be looking for those types of patients who are using eye drops on a regular basis, but yet are not uh, finding the relief that they need. So, uh, the, the three main concepts that I want to really present to you through this uh, webinar is, uh, first of all, that dry eye disease is a progressive disease. 
Uh, the second thing is that there is no cure for dry eye disease. And the third thing is that when it comes to treatment, it's imperative for us to manage the signs and the symptoms. And uh, if we get success with either one of those, I think it's a victory. Um, typically, when we think of dry eye, we think about what we've been doing for years. And there really is an old school methodology for dry eye. We know that the that dry eye is broken up into you know two major components: evaporative dry eye, and then deficiency of the aqueous. Well, two areas that have really started to stand out with regards to our dry eye patients are the patients who have evaporative dry eye and the patients who have Sjogren's. And Sjogren's, as an example, is a disease that is really going to be popping up with increased prevalence now that we've got some additional uh, ways of testing for it. And many practitioners in the eye care world don't know this, and in fact many rheumatologists don't know that Sjogren's is four times more prevalent than rheumatoid arthritis and uh, is very possibly the most common autoimmune disease or nearly the most common autoimmune disease. We just don't detect it soon enough. Traditionally, uh, every company that comes into our offices that try to recommend that we look at dry eye gives us you know, the, their lengthy questionnaires to fill out. These just aren't realistic. I mean, I see patients just like all of you, and it's just not realistic to take every single one of our patients through the symptoms lists that are out there. Um, also, there's lengthy signs that we're looking for with regards to our patients, whether the patient has hyperemia, corneal staining, tear breakup, uh, whether we want to shove a piece of cardboard in their eyes to see how much tears they have. We certainly know osmolarity has played some aspect of eye care diagnostics over the years. Uh, still has some questions on validity. Some of you may use that test with increased frequency over the last couple of years. Um, and then we certainly want to use rose van Gell or lysamine green staining. But even despite the fact that we have all those tests, we don't always know what the information gives us or that that information is credible from time to time. When it comes to treatment, the studies have shown that the average moderate dry eye patient uses wetting drops or prescription medications and it has an effect to nearly $3,000 over the course of the year. Uh, when we look at what they're encountering when they go to the drugstore, it's, it's uh, really confusing. And it brings us to, there really is not a great diagnostic, there really is not a great treatment that we really have encountered as we look over the last couple of years. But we're starting to look at things in a new way. And uh, the way we're looking at it is we're definitely looking at the intrinsic component of evaporative dry eye. We're also looking at where Sjogren's is affecting our patients in new and innovative ways. Uh, so those are really the key aspects I think that we, we need to be you know, coming into. And as we look at the recent research and studies that have come out, we're coming to a conclusion that the vast majority of patients that do have dry eye symptoms and do have dry eye have meibomian gland dysfunction in one way or another. Only 14%, according to this study by LEMP, and I would agree in my practice, only about 14% of those with dry eye report or, or do, in fact, uh, present to the office with aqueous alone as a deficiency, the vast majority presenting with MGD or MGD and a component of aqueous deficiency. So it brings up that we need to be addressing MGD in a very aggressive way. We don't use this questionnaire that is really uh, complicated that uh, I presented earlier. Instead, we, we like to ask our patients uh, a series of questions that is quantifiable with a number. 
And we do that either with the OSDI or the speed questionnaire. In fact, in my office, we use both. Uh, but if I wasn't looking into doing as much research and I was just doing primary care, I would be doing the speed questionnaire on my patients alone. I, I think it gives more information than, than even the OSDI does. But the speed questionnaire, what you do is you have your patients fill out the first part uh, more for your information, part number two and three, the frequency and severity, you add those numbers up and the patient does have um, progressive or significant dry eye if the number comes up above eight. And so what we do is we see our patients back for the follow-up and we look for their symptoms to have improved. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the patient always says that they feel better. But if their symptoms have improved within the speed questionnaire, we know we are improving the dryness or the soreness or the burning and the eye fatigue and that our treatment is working. So this gives us a quantifiable number that we can use from time to time. Now historically, we've done tear breakup time in the exam room and tear breakup time definitely has a place. Uh, I still am trying to figure out what it is. It means, um, even though I'm a dry eye specialist, the information, I'm not entirely sure what it, uh, what it means for our patients. The patient on the left-hand side is having their tears break up consistently in that nasal area, and the one on the right-hand side of your screen, it's, uh, it's, it's breaking up in a varied pattern. And what that really uh, signifies on the right-hand side is more of a, uh, a, a, a lipid deficiency, whereas since it's breaking up consistently in the same area on the left-hand side, that denotes more of an aqueous or more likely a mucin deficiency. We do that in our slit lamps, but potentially what is even more important and what is repeatable, what is quantifiable, what can be documented and is not biased because it's objectivity is the non-invasive tear breakup time. And we do that with the, uh, the keratograph, uh, as, as you can see. And for those of you who use the machine know how this works is the patient blinks several times and you get the instrument set up and then uh, you ask them to keep their eyes open and then the instrument starts to pick up the areas where there is dryness. And uh, it gives you a level of, uh, of dryness and then it also shows you the areas where the patients are drying and how fast the, the drying is. Uh, with the most recent upgrade, you can see uh, a pattern over time uh, comparing these images side by side of your patients, uh, which is definitely a, a, a really cool feature for monitoring and tracking progression and to make sure that you're, uh, you're con you know, what you're doing for treatment is working. One other thing that we think is extremely valuable and has uh, become more of a mainstay of our dry eye evaluation, and in my office, we don't do these tests on the standard eye exam when they come in. We will detect that they have dry eye, and we bring everybody back for an additional dry eye evaluation. Uh, and if they have chronic dry eye, they are specifically recalled for chronic dry eye evals. And what this does, and I apologize just because of the nature of the webinar, we don't have these all animated for you with a video, but you can see the colored pattern uh, in this particular image. And the areas that are kind of in the bottom uh, or the left uh, side, in this case the temporal part, it's a little more colorful and that signifies a more rich layer of the tear film. And we like to look for the dynamic nature of the oils as the patient blinks. And we want to see these colors to be more blue and purple. Colors that are more white or yellow can signify that the patient does not have enough oil in their tear film. And it really does give an indication to the, uh, to the type of dry eye the patient has, particularly if they have MGD. The other thing is historically we've done uh, you know, tear volume with Shermer's, and uh, quite frankly, I just do not like this test at all. 
Um, you can see that I did capture this image from the internet uh, because I don't do this to my patients. And quite frankly, if I did uh, have to go near to this patient, I would most likely pluck his eyebrows as well. Uh, they are a little thick. Um, so instead, what we do for our patients is, um, you know, I'm not quite sure that slide didn't show up there, Craig. Uh, but we instead is we use the uh, keratograph and measure the tear volume. Uh, we'll see if that slide pops in here. But we measure the tear volume uh, with the keratograph, and uh, it's the tear meniscus height. And that's really easy to do. You just take a take an image, and it does show the volume of the tear film. And then you can use the reticule to measure the height of the tear volume. And what you're looking for is you're looking for the patient to have a tear volume greater than 0.2 millimeters. And I usually look for 2 to 3 millimeters. The nice thing about it is it doesn't necessarily mean that if they have above 3 millimeters that their eyes are normal. Because if a patient has an aqueous deficient dry eye, they may tear excessively. So if that tear meniscus height is very, very thick, that could also indicate a different type of dry eye. So it is nice to be able to measure that. Um, outside of the keratograph, this is also an instrument we like to use, and that's, uh, that's called the inflamadry. And what this does is this measures the amount of inflammation uh, in the eye by uh, quantifying or evaluating the, um, the uh, MMP9s, which are an inflammatory marker. And if a patient does have MMP9s above 40 nanograms per milliliter uh, and you swab them, they will have uh, an image like you see here in the center of the test where it turns pink and blue. The blue is the control and then the pink is, um, it signifies the patient has um, above 40 nanograms per milliliter of, uh, of MMP9s. And those types of tests really will help us understand inflammation, tear volume, oil levels. We know in patients who, who have dry eye that a lot of them will start building up keratinase, keratinization along their lid margins. Mark's line is the anatomical demarcation between the anterior and posterior lid. If you put lysamine green on there in a normal eye, you will see a very thin line of staining uh, of you know, the keratinized tissue. But what we see happen is individuals who have progressive dry eye, the keratinization will get larger. And we grade that in, in our office. We grade it as mild, moderate, or, uh, or severe. And the moderate gets into a place where that Mark's line keratinized tissue is just bumping up against the meibomian glands. And the severe is where the keratinized tissue is overlying the meibomian glands. And therefore, the glands would be completely plugged and there would be no way that they can work. One of the ways that we treat this keratinization of Mark's line is to use a golf club spud and we just debride the lid. And there are studies that indicate that that is a good way to help your dry eye patients. So the story goes with meibomian gland dysfunction from the way I understand it from uh, my conversations with and hearing lectures by the uh, godfather of meibomian gland dysfunction, Don Korb is that the muscles of Rylan, which are the muscles that surround the meibomian glands, are the key aspect to squeezing the oil out of the meibomian glands. And when we do not blink, or we only blink part way, those muscles are not activated to express the oil out of the glands, and then the glands can get plugged. And since we blink 50 to 75 percent less when we're on our computer, it's only, I mean, it becomes very apparent why we're seeing more and more patients who work on computers excessively or even children who play video games or are uh, you know on their cell phones that these individuals are presenting with more and more dry eye symptoms 
but we have to understand what that does to the meibomian glands in the long run. The meibomian glands are uh, similar in their morphology to the hair follicles that we have, except they don't exhibit the same way, uh, keratin like our hair follicles do, which is the reason why they don't grow hair. Uh, but they do have these um, akini, which are these little uh, pods that generate the oil for the mybum, and then that mybum travels down the channel of the meibomian gland into the orifice, and that's where it's expressed through the pressure that the uh, muscles of rylan exert. When those muscles are not strengthened or very strong, then it is a key aspect in time uh, for those glands to become plugged. The real kicker is when uh, that becomes chronic. And when that is chronic, we start to see telangiectasia. And if you do look with uh, your slit lamp at a patient's eye who has telangiectasia, it indicates that that patient has a chronic disease of some sort and the eye is responding as a result of it. The real difficult ones for us are the ones like this. These patients when we're doing our normal slit lamp exam, look completely healthy and completely perfect. And the problem is that when I'm expressing those glands, nothing is coming out of the meibomian glands. There is no meibom showing up at all. So these patients may present with no symptoms, but they're what we call non-obvious meibomian gland dysfunction or non-obvious MGD. And these patients' glands are plugged and they will eventually uh, show long-term effects as a result of that plugging if they're not opened up. So what we do is we like to quantify the amount of oil coming out of the meibomian glands and we use an instrument uh, that is made by Tier Science called an MGE. Now not everybody in the country is going to have an MGE and that's fine, but the MGE exerts a certain amount of pressure that is a key amount of pressure. And what that is, is that is one gram of pressure per square millimeter, which is equivalent, or 1.2 gram per square millimeter, which is equivalent to pressure as when we squeeze our eyes tight. And so when we're squeezing our eyes tight, we're putting the same amount of pressure that this instrument does. So it basically mimics what should be happening in the best of cases. And when you express with this, what we do is we start with the temporal side and we look at five glands and we express them and we look to see how many of those glands are flowing and what kind of oil is coming out, whether it's olive oil in appearance, whether it is toothpaste in appearance, or whether it is uh, completely plugged, or you could say uh, olive oil, Crisco, toothpaste, completely plugged and we give the patient a score based on the number and the quality of the glands that they have. And we know that when individuals have above a, uh, or, or less than a score of about 12 or 15, that that is an indication that they have a significant uh, meibomian gland dysfunction where their glands are not functioning at all. So I think that what we need to be doing is we're looking at the oils and the values is understanding how this plays a part and how it can be part of a standard optometric evaluation. So even if you don't have an MGE and include that in your standard optometric examination, just take about 10 to 20 seconds per eye and take your liberty as an eye care practitioner and poke the patient in the eye for goodness sake. So just take your thumb and, and express the oil glands and see if anything comes out. And if there is oil coming out, uh, grade it, whether it's a grade three, whether it's kind of like a Crisco, a grade two, whether it's a solid like toothpaste, grade one, or whether it's blocked and you give them a zero. You count the number of glands that are presenting like that, and then you take it times the, the quality of the oil that is coming out. And uh, the, the other beauty about this is then you can correlate that to the uh, volume and the amount of dry eye that a patient has. Uh, and so I think that this is a very valuable test. 
quite possibly the most valuable thing that I think that we have introduced in the diagnostic component as far as imaging, I think the MGE and the expression and looking at those oils and grading those oils is a key component, but as far as imaging is there's nothing nearly as valuable to me in my dry eye assessment now as mybography. And uh, this is an image taken with the keratograph and you can see how beautiful the akinai eye are on the lower eyelids and the upper eyelids. And this is a very healthy meibomian gland lid that this patient is presenting with. We grade the meibomian glands for our patients depending on the very area of loss or the percentage loss. And this has been studied and published with regards to what is happening. And as you can see, going from zero to one in that patient who has one, that there are a couple glands that are starting to show some death. All the way down to grade three, where 50 to 75% of the glands are dead. And grade four, where greater than 75% of the glands are gone. The real shame here is that once our patients get into grade two, three, and four, there is absolutely nothing we can do to bring those glands back. That person will only progress and get worse in the gland loss. They will not, never get better. That is um, truly the, the shame of, of dry eye disease. Uh, to the point where I think it's critical for us to be adding mybography to every single evaluation, just like we wouldn't be doing a, a, a glaucoma evaluation nowadays without OCT technology, I think that mybography is the OCT of the anterior segment. How are we to know the quality of the mybum that is going to be coming out of our patient's eye in the long term if we don't assess the mybomian glands? And here this patient is a relatively normal, and then this one here uh, you can see has a significant amount of loss. And it's very, very revealing once you start looking at your patient's mybomian glands, particularly if they're working on a computer. The loss that is occurring is occurring because a gland that's plugged has no place for the oil to go and the gland basically just says, well, if I'm not going to be working, I might as well retire. And then they end up quitting and uh, give up and, and end up dying. So that's a critical component. One of the other beautiful things we can do with the keratograph is we can image it with different colors and uh, to, to make the meibomian glands that are healthy pop out a little bit more, as you can see from the bottom. I want to point out uh, something that, that was, was somewhat interesting for me when, when I evaluated some of my patients. This patient right here is actually a 19-year-old Asian female. Um, a, a very lovely young lady, but she was reporting significant dry eye and presented to the office. You can see the beauty and the youth of the meibomian glands on her upper eyelids, but she has about 90% gland loss on her lower eyelid. And this is uh, you know, something she is going to have to suffer with her entire life, and we need to make sure that the glands are open that she does have. Her glands were plugged, and so we worked to open them back up, but it allows us to evaluate the, the quality. Now, the other thing that we can look at is what is the effect of not having enough oil have on the eye? And uh, one of the things that we're looking at more and more utilizing either rose bengal or lysamine green is uh, lid wiper epitheliopathy. And that is the, uh, the wiper area of the eyelid that rubs across the surface. We know a significant number of our contact lens wearing patients that have discomfort have lid wiper epitheliopathy. The studies indicate that. But what I've discovered now that I'm looking at this, you know, uh, every day in my dry eye patients is even those who don't have contact lens wear have this very thing. And that was, is where you look at things like interferometry and tear breakup time. 
And what those things indicate is that there's not a good oil layer, and if there's not enough oil in the engine, friction is going to occur, and that's exactly what is happening with midwiper epitheliopathy. So for these patients, number one is treat the underlying condition, evaluate the meibomian glands using mybography to make sure that the meibomian glands are healthy, and then evaluate the amount of oil that is coming out of them using the MGE or expressing with your finger. And then if the glands are plugged, get them opened and get them flowing again. Beyond that, uh, if you're still getting lid wiper epitheliopathy because the patient cannot produce enough oil, you may want to use a product that has an oil emulsion to it, uh, like Sustain Balance or Retain MGD. And those sort of things are really what the hallmarks of, of where we're at with our dry eye disease. We know if a patient has, for instance, uh, non-inflammatory, because we have done the inflammatory, non-inflammatory dry eye, and their meibomian glands are healthy, and they have an aqueous deficiency, punctal plugs are an excellent option for them. They're just not making enough tears. They may be making, uh, you know, oil-rich tears, but the tears are not in abundance like they should be, and an excellent option for punctal plugs. Uh, we also know that restasis decreases inflammation, and it's an immunomodulator to support the decrease of inflammation, but also through T-cell integration, the uh, production of more tears. Uh, if a patient does has inflammatory dry eye, you know, you will want to put them on something that's going to decrease that in the short term, which would be something like Lodamax, and then to maintain that is where restasis comes in. Um, and I mentioned earlier that if a patient has some sort of uh, meibomian gland dysfunction that cannot be uh, alleviated with opening the glands alone, then you're going to want to use something like sustained balance or retain MGD, which has a higher emulsion. And then uh, in our office, we also utilize the lippy flow system, and we utilize that heavily on individuals who have uh, loss of glands through mybography, but also have, have plugged glands through the MGE. And uh, that really points us in the direction of who is going to be using that treatment and needing that treatment. And then one of the things that really is coming into play more and more, um, uh, before I get there, uh, the Sustain Ultra is a, is a great option uh, for patients who need something to support the, the basement layer of their tears, the mucin, or maybe to support the aqueous type of, uh, type of dry eye. And other types of dry, dry eye drops are out there as well, but make sure that the dry eye that drop that you're using fresh coat or sustain or uh, or blink or refresh, make sure you're using the right drop for the patient. We've been coming into uh, where nutraceuticals play a critical role for our dry eye patients as well, and uh, nutraceuticals are a, a major component. Uh, Omega-3 is specifically those that are high and rich in DHA and EPA. Uh, that make up 70% of the omega-3s are a critical aspect for our dry eye patients. And it's amazing to me that I have had patients who come back and say, I've been using the supplements that you have recommended to me, and, you know, after only a, a month or two, and I feel a lot better, and I feel it's the supplements that are doing that. I don't think I would have believed that a couple years ago, but now with the newer products that are out there, um, and we recommend Easy Tears for our patients because it has a great omega-3, but it also has other components that decrease inflammation in our eyes. So when you're looking and recommending a product for your patient, um, some of the generic ones, for example, uh, a, the Kirkland Costco brand, um, your patients would need to take about three or four daily doses of that product to get the same value as some of the good eye-specific uh, products like Easy Tears. And uh, so not, not that we're having a commercial for them, because uh, other products have high levels of omegas. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're recommending it. And if your patient says, yes, I use omega-3s, don't stop the conversation there. Get a little more in-depth. 
The last thing is if we do all of this treatment for our patients and we get their tears healthy and we get their glands producing oil, it's all in vain if we don't teach our patients to blink. And we uh, do blinking exercises for our patients and uh, really uh, boast about the value of uh, strengthening the tarsal muscle and having the patient feel the sensation right where their upper brow is. Uh, they don't need to squeeze their eyes tight as this patient is not here. You don't want to use the facial muscles, but you want to use the tarsal muscles to really teach the patient to blink. And we evaluate our patients uh, when they first come in as far as their blinking, their quality of their blink, and how, how, how um, much they blink. And then we also evaluate them after they've been doing blinking exercises. And really what we can come into here is we can stop treating dry eye and we really want to be start looking, looking for ways that we can start stopping its progression. And the key aspect to this, in my opinion, is mybography. For patients who have mybography, uh, who have done, had mybography done and they're losing their meibomian glands, it's synonymous to those patients who have optic nerve loss and we're not doing anything about it. I think it is a key area for us to really stop the uh, epidemic of dry eye that is going to be happening with our patients that are using computers and not blinking appropriately. So I think it's a hallmark area for our dry eye patients to be able to preserve these meibomian glands, to be able to pre preserve the symptoms that they have as well as the signs for dry eye that they have because we know that dry eye is progressive. We know there is no cure for dry eye. We may be able to turn them around so that their symptoms are less, and we can manage those symptoms doing things like the speed questionnaire, and then we can manage the signs when we have things like mybography. We have the ability to measure tear meniscus height. We have the ability to uh, both in our slit lamp measure tear breakup time, but also to do a non-invasive tear breakup time that can be really, really helpful. And things like interferometry are becoming more and more a part of our practice because they tell us about the volume of the oil that our patients currently have in, uh, in their tears. So the future of dry eye is, is exciting. Uh, and the reason for that is because now not only do we have ways of looking at our patients that have dry eye in a new way, but we also have some really, really cool ways of treating them now that we can differentiate the type of dry eye and the reason that they have dry eye. We'll pass Dr. it back over to you, Craig. Thank you very much, Dr. David Keating. That was a great webinar. Uh, there are a few questions here that um, have paneled through. Uh, one of the questions is, I've been having trouble using the MGE. Any tips for using this device? Uh, yeah, so it can be a little tricky, uh, for sure. So the first thing that we like to recommend our, uh, our patients do, or what we do to our patients, um, is, uh, is to dry off the surface of the lid. And so what we do is we take a uh, cotton-tipped applicator. That's what we say to our patients, but really it's just a Q-tip. And we wipe the surface of the eyelid so that it's completely dry. If your patient has severe dry eye, I believe that their meibomian glands begin to in turn into the ocular surface more and more. In a perfect sense, the meibomian gland should sit at the surface of the eye and, near, and nearly be perpendicular to the, uh, to the ocular surface, and so they are expressing oil into it. But I believe as there is more friction, and I don't have this confirmed by anybody smarter than me, so take it with a grain of salt, but I believe as we build up friction that the meibomian glands begin to intern more and more and more. And so when you're doing your MGE and the patient is, has those interned meibomian glands, unless you dry the surface really well, keep your finger on the lid, use the MGE to somewhat regress that, that lid back a little bit, and then express it, it's going to be very difficult to tell whether there's any oil coming out because it's in the tear meniscus. 
So it, it can be difficult in those cases, Craig. Thank you. Uh, another question we have here is, what is the reason for MG loss? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's several reasons, and uh, the one I believe to be the most apparent, uh, well, I'll, I'll say this. I believe that there is some age changes that are going to take place in everybody, and there's some papers and posters that are coming out particularly with uh, a PhD student that's working with uh, Eric Pappas in Australia. She's, a, she's um, a, a Dutch woman, and I apologize, I can't remember her name offhand, but uh, her work with Pappas is looking at normal meibomian glands as we age to see if individuals who are older have changes. And so that work is coming out, and I, I do believe that we have some loss as we age. I do also believe that our diet plays somewhat of a role into it, and those were the two things that I believed were the primary reasons until more recently in hearing the research and the philosophies that uh, Don Korb has brought up with regards to when you're not blinking appropriately, then the glands are, uh, the muscles that express the oil out of the glands are not going to work and that oil that is in the gland will become hardened like Crisco and will then eventually turn into toothpaste and then it will plug and then the gland will atrophy. And so the lack of blinking is something that we're seeing more and more in our patients. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, another question here is, is there an affordable interferometer available? Well, Craig, I think your team probably could uh, could bring that up and answer that question. I think that the uh, interferometry that is in the keratograph is relatively, you know, is, is pretty affordable. And the the reason why it is affordable is because you also get uh, mybography, you also get tear breakup time, you also get tear meniscus height. And it's a darn good topographer, too. I mean, we didn't even talk about utilizing the instrument for... Uh, our ortho K or our keratoconus patients um, and progression there. So it, you get all of those different features within the interferometer that's attached to the keratograph. Um, and maybe that's, that's biased, but that's the one that I use. I also use the one in the lippy view, uh, but that one's quite a bit more expensive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dave Kading, on behalf of Oculus and the attendees, we thank you very much for your time and the educational webinar you have shared with us. We look forward to working with you again in the near future. Thank you very much, Craig. It was a, it was a pleasure, and uh, uh, anybody's free to email me with any questions you have. You can see my email address at the bottom of the, uh, the webinar, and uh, I wish you all best of luck with your dry eye patients. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending another great educational webinar by Oculus and Dr. David Kading. Uh, please keep watching our emails and Oculus website for other educational webinars on different instruments and topics. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Oculus website very soon. The Oculus website is www.oculususa.com. That's O-C-U-L-U-S-U-S-A.com. Thank you very much and have a good day.